All right, Proverbs chapter 4 in your Bibles, if you would please. Proverbs chapter 4. We've taken a little bit of time in the last several uh, weeks and talking about uh, the book of Proverbs and different themes. Talked about children in the book of Proverbs, parents in the book of Proverbs. We talked a little bit about the different personalities in the book of Proverbs. Talk about leadership. Tonight I want to talk about the topic of love in the book of Proverbs. Uh, of course, a song of, song, a song of Solomon is much about love, and Solomon wrote these. Some of them he sat down across the table and talked to his son, uh, Rehoboam, and others, and giving them information, and God records that in the Scripture. Others of them, he just spoke wise things, and men wrote it out and said, hey, that's really good, let's write that down. And the Lord used uh, and put many of it into the Holy Scriptures, ordained by the Lord and inspired by the Lord, in our King James Bible, and I'm very thankful for that. But uh, love is uh, a word that pops up several times. Now, the, the Bible is full of the concept of love. From Jeremiah, it talks about, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. The book of 1 John is about love. Um, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. God describes himself as he, God is love. And it's definitely one of the major things. Love is the bond of perfectness. It is the bond of a mature Christian. Uh, it is the end. He, he tells us in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And you can almost make a case that all other eight words that follow that are really an outgrowth of love. And the love issue is really big. Jesus sat with Peter on the shores of Galilee before he would take off and go to be with his father within the next few days. And he said to Peter, lovest thou me? Where am I? Where, where am I in your significance? Do you love me? More than these, assuming it was the pile of fish that he had caught for a fisherman a very good day at the market. But he had to ask him, do you love me? And he said, if you love me, then... Feed my sheep. You ask him three times. And because that's really, the, that really makes a difference. You know, uh, holy standards of righteousness, it's not really about what you think or I think. It's about our love problem. It's our love issue. Soul winning is obedience. We do it because God, and Jesus said, if you love me, you will. Why in the world would you tell folks about Christ? Because God asked us to do it. If you're saved and you need to get baptized, why do you get baptized? Because you understand how much God loves you and he asks you to do it. Peter told Cornelius and his friends in Acts chapter 10, verse number 48, he tells them, he said, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Why do you get baptized after you're saved? Because it's a command. What do you do to show your, your, the Lord you love him? You obey him. God kind of uses the thermometer of obedience to test the temperature of our love. If a person says, I love, and they don't, they don't obey, they're really lying. It's one of the greatest things that older women are supposed to teach the younger women to love their husbands and love their children. By the way, let me just real quickly just say this. I was talking to Linda about this recently. But older ladies, don't miss your stage of life and your purpose. Younger ladies, don't think you're too cool for the older ladies. Don't let pride keep you from listening. And we need that. We need this multi-generational church. I don't, I'm not against life stages and having all the young couples be together. The truth of the matter is, wise is the young lady who understands, I tell you what, who knows a little bit more than, than my 25-year-old my friend over here. A 75-year-old mother who's raised multiple children, who's been a good godly wife. You might want to get over there and talk to them. You might have the wisdom and humility to listen to them. And then older ladies, you're, you're supposed to have the responsibility to, uh, to minister and realize your purpose is not just to sit around and watch soap operas. None that you would do that, I'm sure. But, you know, it's, it, there's more to just, you know, learning your iPhone all the time. There, there are, there's a purpose. There's something God wants you to do. There's somebody that you're supposed to help and instruct. And I think this is, this is an important thing. Husbands, the greatest need of a wife, and those of you who have daughters, especially is love. A, a wife yearns to know, am I significant? Am I going to be okay? Am I significant and secure? 
Now, man has some of those same things, but he has a total different fuel. His fuel is responsive respect, not disrespect, not your agenda, not your, not your nagging. It's going, to be, it's going to be your respect and your response and trusting the Lord enough to respond right. For men, our job is to love. He said, husbands, love your wife. Why? Because that, that meets her at the greatest point of her need, shows her significance and her security. But we are, we are, we're whistling the wind if we think we can do this without the help of God. And love is not a fruit of your flesh. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And we need the Lord's help on that. In the book of Proverbs, a little more practical. I want to talk to you a little bit about the object. What are some things that just Proverbs says, we need to love this? What are some things he says, I don't want you to love? See, there's some things in Proverbs you'll find. He says, now here's what you need to love, and here's what I don't want you to love. And then he's going to talk a little bit about what love does. Love covereth the multitude of sins. We read that in 1 Peter. And then, what really attracts the love of God for us? Now, God loves everybody. He loves everybody. We understand that. God so loved the world. You're in the world. He loves you. But there are, there are people that feel and experience a greater love for God. You ever wonder why John, and Brother Eddie and I heard a message today about that, why John would say and, and refer to himself five times in the book of John as the, as the disciple whom Jesus love was he the only one that Jesus loved but he may have been the one who loved him first and loved him most deeply because wherever Jesus was John was John wasn't gonna be sitting at the end of the table if he could have had a seat beside Jesus he wasn't gonna let Peter beat him to the empty tomb if he could get there first John John felt loved by God because he loved God he loved him and uh, we love God because he first loved us. But I'm telling you, uh, there, are, there are, how about this one in the, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, where the Bible talks about that God loveth a cheerful what? Well, does he love everyone? Yes. But I think he puts his love on and in and through in a very special way in the heart of somebody who's giving. They have a special awareness of the love of God. I think it's very important to experience that. And no one will ever serve God for a lifetime who's not totally convinced that God loves them. If, you, if you're having to put God on trial, if he loves you or doesn't love you based upon the weather today or how this is happening or what's going on, you're going to have a very arduous life. And you're going to have a very low, committed life. You won't trust a God. You won't serve a God you won't trust. And you're certainly not going to trust a God that you don't feel like he loves you. And it's never been up for anyone's opinion. You need to take God at his word. He loves you. There's not a he loves me, he loves me not. It's always he loves me, he loves me, loves me. And you need to believe what he said. And boy, Satan is successful. The world's successful in convincing us because this way, this didn't happen for me. My one ear is a little higher than my other ear. My teeth are crooked. My metabolism is not like somebody else. And all of a sudden, well, all of a sudden God's on trial. He doesn't care about me. Well, that's a bad, bad thinking. I would call that stinking thinking. That's not, that's not the way God wants us to think. He wants us to know that he loves us. Well, let's talk about this, this, this topic. You'll need to get your Bible open. Everybody get your Bible open. We're in the book of Proverbs. We'll start in verse number, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And let's look at it together we can, look into this study. Chapter 4, verse 5, the Bible says, get wisdom. So what's the topic we're getting here? Get understanding, forget it not, neither decline it from the words of thy mouth. He says, I want you to make a pursuit for wisdom. Quickly, wisdom is kind of seeing life from God's lenses. It's, it's trying to get God's perspective on this. Years ago, I was told that wisdom is pinpointing and practicing God's way of doing things. Okay, there's a way that seemeth right to us, and end of that's going to mess you up. If you're trying to be a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, a brother or sister, an employee in your own mindset, you're just continuing down a, a, a train wreck of decision. It's going, to bring, it's going to bring death to your potential, your, your relationships, your, 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 your purposes. It's going to mess things up. You don't want to do it things. You want to do things God's way. He said, make that a priority. Now, verse 6, read it with me if you would, please. Chapter 4, verse 6. Are you ready? Forsake her not, 
love her. So the first thing we're supposed to love in chapter 4, verse number 6 is what? Wisdom. Yeah. You love wisdom and she's going to love you back. That's what the Bible's telling us. So he said, I want you to have a, a, a passionate love pursuit of doing things God's way. It'd be a very good thing if, if everything we decide to do, we say, okay, what does the Lord want me to do here? I've gotten, gotten people really frustrated with me occasionally in counseling because they'll give me all kinds of, 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 of information and I'll just say, okay, what do you think God wants you to do? And I'll say, Pastor, don't ask a dumb question like that. Oh, but you know what the answer is. But, what, but if it happened to you, what would you do? I would hope I would do what the Lord wants me to do. Because you want to get wisdom. If you love wisdom, she'll love you back. You'll be the happy camper in the end of that. Let's look at the next thing we're supposed to love. If you would please turn to chapter 5. And this is primarily for the husbands. But look at chapter 5. Let's look, if we can, please, at verse number 19. And uh, verse 19 says, let her, this is the wife. Let's pick up verse number, let's go ahead and look at verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be diverse abroad, and the rivers and the, and the waters in the streets. Let them be thine only, and not, thy, and not a stranger's with thee. Verse number 18, let thy fountains be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Love the wife that God gave you. Let her be as a loving hind and uh, a pleasant role. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Let her beauty be what you look for. Be thou ravished always with her love. Verse number 20. And why wilt thou, my son, ravish or be enraptured or filled with a strange woman? Embrace the woman of a stranger. For the ways of men are before the eyes of the Lord. He pondereth all his going. So the second thing Proverbs tells us, number one, love wisdom. Number two, love your wife. Love your wife. Take your, be ravished. That means enraptured with her. Don't be enraptured with another with a, a woman that's not yours. You say, what's a strange woman means? It means it's a woman that's not yours. And the Bible reminds us that the mouth of a strange woman is like a deep pit. You can't get out of it. You're going to have to have a lot of assistance to get out of it. And whosoever is abhorred of the Lord, they fall into that kind of a pit. Boy, and that just teaches me something. I don't want to get God ticked off at me. And we already know what God gets ticked off at. Can't stand a proud look. Can't stand lying tongues. He can't stand someone that's always stirring up drama, sowing discord among the brethren. That aggravates God. And you can almost find a parallel when men and women fall into immorality. There is pride. There is there's deceit. There is a sowing of discord. There's a critical spirit. They kind of go before somebody falls into a pit of, of immorality. And so, but the way you, you, way you have a great marriage and the way you improve your marriage is you grow grass and not have to kill every stinking weed. You fall deeply in love with the wife that God gave you. You keep loving. You're enraptured with her. And, and that is something God tells us to do. He says, husbands, I want you to love the wife that God gave you. And don't want another wife. Love her. Be enraptured with her. So love wisdom. Love your wife. Look at the next one, chapter 12, verse number 1. Can we look at 12, 1? Let's all read it together. Just the, just the, uh, the men. All read verse, chapter 12, verse 1. Are you ready? Whoso loveth instruction, loveth, but he that hateth reproof. Okay, he so said, if you love instruction, uh, you love knowledge. You love knowledge, and, and, and he that hates reproof is brutish. I, I will tell you, we ought to love to learn. Love to be instructed. I hope that you are like, even when you, when, you, when you read your Bible tomorrow morning, you're saying, Lord, please teach me something. Uh, when, you, when you're in church service or a chapel or a class, you're saying, Lord, please teach me something. Help me be a learner. I was walking with Brother, Brother uh, Cowling after chapel the other day, and, and Brother Cowling, you know, he and Noah went to high school together and came off the ark separately. But, they were, you know, he, this guy, he's been there long. He has probably heard, he's been teaching at the college how many years now? 48 years? 48 years. Can you imagine how many chapel messages he's listened? He's heard so many life-changing messages, he doesn't even know his name. But you know, he, he said, boy, that was a good message today. Oh, God spoke to my heart on that. I thought to myself, here's a guy that has heard hundreds and thousands of messages, but the one he just now heard spoke to his heart, helped him. Well, I think there's something about that. We're supposed to love instruction, love learning, 
Be a reader. Study the Bible. Ask yourself, what can I learn from the situation? But a, but a foolish man, he has no interest to learn something else. Let's look at another one. We're supposed to love wisdom. We're supposed to love our wife. We're supposed to love instruction. Let's go to chapter 9, back up there, verse number 8. Ladies, would you mind reading verse number 8 of chapter 9? Everyone, girls, ready? Reprove. He said, I, he said you, you need to love reproof. You need to be able to accept when you're wrong. And when someone gets on to you, someone points a problem out that you have, we need to say, okay, I appreciate that. Now, what does it take to accept reproof? What, what, what concept do you think it takes? Humility. Yeah. How about 15, verse number 12? Proverbs 15, 12. And let's read it together, everyone together. Ready? Chapter 15, verse 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. A scorner would not accept someone pointing out something negative in them. And many of us, we struggle with rejection. We struggle with reproof. Someone puts their finger in our little pudding and tells us we're not doing what's right. We get mad at the person rather than accept the reproof. And he says, look, if we're going to be what God wants us to be, you want to love wisdom. You want to love your wife. You want to love instruction. You want to accept and love someone who reproves you. You reprove a fool, he'll make a fool out of you or try to. He'll hate you if you try, to, you try to reprove him. But someone who is wise will love the reprover. Look at the last one we'll give you on this talk very quickly. Chapter 22, verse number 12. 22, 12, we're talking about love here. You're doing great, and thank you very much for your diligence this evening. Verse number 12, 22, verse number 12. Let's read it all together. You ready? The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. I have got the wrong verse here. Let's pick up right before them. Verse about, how about verse 11? I think I wrote down the wrong verse. I wanted to put 11 and 12. Let's look at 11. He that loveth pureness of heart for the king. So what are we supposed to love there? What do you think pureness of heart? What comes to your mind when you think about pureness of heart? Anybody have an idea? I'm on the platform here, Brother Mark. What are you thinking about? A single focus? Good. Holiness? Yeah. Anybody else have a thought? Yeah, lack of deceit, no, 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 uh, un, not unfeigned, not fake. He said, he, we ought to love pureness of heart. How many appreciate when you meet someone who is sincere? They're genuine, no fake. Not, no one's perfect, but you can sense that kind of what you see is what you get. They're not given to change. What's a beautiful thing, except for changes that need to be made in our own lives. They're just... Pretty consistent, sincere, genuine. And you know, that's something God tells us. I want you to love having a pureness of heart. It ought to be something we, we have a passion for. So we looked at a few things. These are the ones that we've identified. There are things that we're supposed to love in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom, our wife, instruction, reproof, and purity of heart, sincerity. We ought to have a, 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 a passion for that. Let's look at a couple things real quickly that we should not love in the book of Proverbs. How about this, if you would, please look at, first of all, chapter 1, verse number 22. Chapter 1, verse number 22. Can we look at it together and read it? Here's the question, everyone. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in the scorning, and fools hate knowledge. So he says, how long will you simple ones love what? Simplicity. Now, Sometimes the, the, the word simplicity in the Bible, Apostle Paul said, I'm, I'm nervous, he spoke to some carnal Christians, that you are going to get away from the simplicity that is in Christ. You've made, you've made the walk with God too complicated. And you've got all these rules and do's and don'ts, but you're not, you're not have a love for the Lord. The, the person getting away from, as soon as we can have phylacteries in a church, and we get excited about a program and about this and about that, but really Jesus gets, gets um, grayed out in the whole thing. We want to make sure Christ is paramount. But I think here is speaking about nothingness. It's just you're good, you're good at nothing. How long will you love vanity? You ever wonder how much time we spend on doing something that doesn't matter for eternity? How much time we spend maybe on social media, I just put my finger there, or maybe on a video game or sports. 
And once again, nothing wrong with any of those things in somewhat of moderation. But it would be terrible to put your, put your ladder up against a wrong building. Spend all your life getting good at something that doesn't matter. Simplicity. That's how long are you going to You just Everything is just about nothing that matters for eternity. That's why I can't stand it when people start fighting with each other. Because you waste so much energy fighting uh, a brother or sister and not at the, at the expense of, of things you could do. That you could be a help to people. And instead, you're so, we're so self-absorbed with whatever's going on. I've watched it. I've done it. I don't like it. He said, you're, 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 going to be, you're going to love simplicity, something that's vain and, and empty. He says, don't love simplicity. Number two, let's look at this. We need to hasten just for the sake of that. Chapter 17, verse 19. So don't love simplicity, emptiness, or things that don't matter. Then look at uh, chapter 17, verse number 19. And let's read that here. The Bible says, he loveth transgression that loveth what? Strife, and he that exalted his gate to see, uh, seeketh destruction. He loveth transgression that loveth what? Okay. I am convinced there's some people, if they can't find drama, they make it up. You've heard me say this, strife is our life. Some people, strife is their life. And he said, look, a person that loves transgression, he also loves strife. And and. Jesus, the Lord tells us in, in Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant together. And I understand you can't just sing kumbaya with everybody and get along. With there's a time where you have to earnestly contend for the faith that was living. There, there's things you have to stand and having done all to stand. You can't walk with everybody. You can't, you can't agree with everybody. But most of the time you can agree, you can agree to disagree agreeably. But he said, don't, don't, don't love strife. Some folks, and of course, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he tells us the servant of God, the first qualification, a servant of God must not strive, but he must be gentle, patient, apt to teach, in meekness, instructing or working with people that oppose themselves. If God prevents you, by the way, if you're striving, you're not going to be very good at helping someone. In that race in, in Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible tells us uh, toward the end where he says, be careful, watch diligence, and see men fail the grace of God, let's see the root of bitterness. Before he says that, he said, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no one can see the Lord. You know, one thing you want to do in your life, you want to have a good, clear view of Jesus. I may talk about this tomorrow in chapel, but but I, I was thinking about this, this passage all week long, and I, and I heard some thoughts on it today to help me. But remember that, that story in Isaiah chapter 6? When the year that Uzziah die, died, I saw the what? He saw him for really what he was. He was all thinking about the political blessings of 52 years of Uzziah being our king. He was the answer to everything. By the way, God help us. We think the government's the answer to everything. You got to look a little higher than, than the political aspect of things. We got to look a little bit higher. We got to see Him high and lifted up. You know what? You know, excuse our vision of God, interpersonal problems with everybody else. He said, "Follow peace. Stay in your lane, and holiness. If you don't, you can't see God." And remember that second verse of Hebrews chapter twelve tells us to looking unto Jesus, the finisher of our faith. So He says, "Don't, don't love strife." Don't love simplicity. Look, another one we're not supposed to love in verse number three, excuse me, chapter 20. This is a rough one. It's going to really be con convicting to many of you who are, who are fighting off sleep tonight. Chapter 20, verse 13. Are you ready? Read it out loud with me, nice and loud so your neighbor wakes up. Are you ready? Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes. Bread. He says, I don't love sleep. I think all of us need sleep, and some of us might need a little bit extra sleep from time to time. We get worn out and, and overworked and over overcommitted. But he said, sleep is not something we should love. He said, open your eyes and labor and work so you'll have what you need. And boy, I tell you what, the reason oftentimes people need help uh, and, and they have to say, my name is Jimmy Jacob, give me or help me, help me, help me, help me is oftentimes it's because 
when they're sleeping when you're awake. They're spending while you're saving. They're sitting while you're working. And that's why they oftentimes have need. They beg and harvest and have nothing because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't reap when it was opportunity to take time. They didn't sow right. And I think it's important. We not, not love sleep. That's, that's just a practical aspect. Let's look one more. 21, verse number 17. 21, 17. Let's read it together. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil. So the Bible tells us, I don't want you to fall in love with pleasure. Now, it's good to have a vacation. I think it's very good to have a vacation. I think you need to take some time to come apart or you will eventually come apart. I think it's, it's not a bad to go to a ball game or do something occasionally that's recreational. But he said, don't, don't live your life for the next party. Don't live your life for the next pleasure. Don't get in a comfort zone. Don't raise your appetites. He said, if you love pleasure, they'll take you places, they'll take you, places you shouldn't go. You'll be doing things you shouldn't do. You'll be with people you shouldn't be with. He said, he that loveth pleasure, boy, it'll, it'll, it'll complicate some things. So we know some things to love. We know we're supposed to love wisdom. We're supposed to love our wife. Uh, we're supposed to love instruction and love reproof. It's okay to accept that. The Bible tells us we should love a pureness of heart. We should not love sleep. We should not love pleasure. We should not love simplicity or vanity. We should not love strife. Well, let's talk just for a second uh, what love, what are some of the byproducts of love or outcomes of love? Let's go to chapter 10 and verse number 12. We need to hasten. We have just a few moments and we'll conclude. Chapter 10 and verse number 12. Let's look what love does. Verse number 12, just the ladies. Ready, girls? Hatred. Now everybody, let's read it together. Hatred stirreth up strife. What does love do? It covers sin. It is, uh, when, when love is thin, other people's faults are thick. You want to find a critical person always pointing out problems in other people? It's because their love, their love tank is low. But when love is thick, other people's faults are thin. When you have a lot of love, you can cover the sin. And, and I'm not talking about hiding things. I'm just talking about it's not a big deal. We're going we're gonna to forgive. We're going to work through that. Forgiveness can be offered there. We can ex exercise all those gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us in, in Galatians chapter 5, that the fruit of the Spirit will be, will be peace and love and joy and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, generosity, uh, the meekness, temperance, faith. All those things will be birthed out of a, out of a love. It covers the multitude of sins. Look, another thing that it does, look, if you would please, at chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. The Bible says, he that spareth his rod, or spareth disciplining his child, hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him be times, early on. That's what be times means, early on. Uh, you help them in the early part of their life, and you have a lot less problems at the later part of their life. Heard someone say, if you don't learn to break the will of your child by four, they'll find out how to do your, break your heart by 14. And it's going to be some challenging situations there that's going to come. And I think uh, what love does, it gives a parent courage to lovingly administer training and discipline and chastisement because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's look at another one that love does. Look at chapter 15, verse 17. 15, 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than stalled ox and hatred therewith. There's other things I could say about this, but, but I think... You know what real love does? When I, when, I, when I have a genuine heart of love, I think it brings a contentment to me, a, a satisfaction, a contentment. I'd rather have uh, herbs, just like, just like um, leaf soup, and have love than to have a stalled ox and have strife. So love, lo love lurks to be content with a little bit as long as everything's okay. It brings a contentment. By the way, is contentment natural? It is not natural. We're, we're, we're conditioned from childhood. If we want something, scream real loud. Throw a fit. Manipulate. Get someone's attention. That's how you get what you want. 
And the Apostle Paul said, I have learned, and what's the verse said to him? Therewith to be content. Let's look at something else real quickly if we can. In chapter 17, verse 17, what does love do? What's a byproduct or an outcome of love? 17, 17. Read it with me if you would, please. A friend. Love helps me learn to care for people. I love people at all times, even whenever times are not good for them. It's, a, it's an adverse time. That's what real love does. A beautiful testimony here. Well, what, what, uh, what attracts the love of God for a person? Let's just look at three verses that, that. We've talked a little bit about what we should love, what we shouldn't love. Talked about some of the byproducts of love. Courage to discipline our children, to love them, cover sin. It breeds a contentment inside of us, and it caused me to care for other people, to be outward focused and not selfie focused. Well, what, what, do, what do we see that, that God really seems to have a, a, attracts his love, especially on and in someone? Here's three thoughts. We're in chapter 15, verse number 9. Can you look at that? 15, 9, here's what the Bible says. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Would you finish the verse with me? But he loveth him. He really is attracted to the righteous Christian. To the Christian who is excited about finding out what's the right thing to do. Someone who just does the right thing. I, I can't answer for God, but that's what he just said. He said, loveth the Christian he loves someone who follows after righteousness. But I have nine children, and it's, it's easy to gravitate to a child who just obeys. They just do the right thing. You got some of them that, that just some, from time to time, they go through seasons where they just, it's hard to want to hard to, to wanna do anything for them because they just complicate your life by their decisions. And so I understand as a father, I love all my kids, and God loves you. You know what really attracts his, his attention, his care, his generosity to us? I think it's, it's our behavior. It's our, it's our commitment to righteousness. Look at another one here. We find chapter 3, verse number 11 and 12. Chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. We have this verse and one other to look at. Thank you for hanging with us here. Verse 11, chapter 3. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. That's his quoted again in the New Testament. Let's look at verse 12 and let's read it together. For whom the Lord, even as the Father, the Son, God loveth the righteous Christian. He, he loves you when you get corrected. How many, how many have ever got caught in something you thought, I wasn't supposed to get caught. I was supposed to get wiped. And you did. And you're upset, but at the same time, you're a little relieved. Like, whew. I know, I remember one time listening to one of our kids say, I know my daddy loves me because he makes me go to bed at night. You know, it's like, because he, he won't let me do this. He loves me. You know, and I, I think, why would a kid do that? After I've disciplined my children, oftentimes they have come to me and I don't understand it, but they want, they want to reconcile. They want to feel loved. They want to see embraced. It's a beautiful thing. And he said, whenever God corrects you, know he loves you. He loves you. Then look at the last one, and that's chapter 8, verse 17. Thank you for your attention tonight. And let's just look at this one. This one speaks for itself. I think you see what it says. Let's see what the Bible says here, and let's read it together. You ready? 8, 8, verse 17. I love them and those. I love them that. So who does God get a gravitation to? To the loving Christian. To the one that loves him, he loves them back. And you feel the love of Christ. He loves you no matter what. But these are some things I think can help us tonight. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege to look into your word and to read 25 verses or so that speak of love in the book of Proverbs. Things we should love, things we shouldn't love, some of the attributes of love, and then certainly those things that, that uh, we know you love us when you correct us. When we do what's right, you tend to love those things especially who, who obey. And then, Lord, thank you that we can, we can experience more love from you when we learn to love you first, and thank you for that. I pray you bless now this study, make it profitable. With heads bowed and eyes closed, real quick, is there anyone here that would say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart tonight. I know what he said to me, and I'm going to speak back to him and ask him for his help in that area. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that? 